Good morning. Welcome to San Diego Chinese Historical Museum. I'm Lily Birmingham. I'm the director. Today, I have invited my friend, Lucas Perez. We are going to introduce Chinese calligraphy to you. It will be a lot of fun. So I actually grew up in Taiwan, and I learned Chinese painting and calligraphy before I came to the uh, United States in 1976. So Lucas, how did you learn? Yeah, I learned or started learning when I was living in Tokyo, Japan for about six years. Um, and I traveled extensively throughout East Asia studying uh, Chinese calligraphy and picking up some cool objects and uh, that's it basically. Cool. Um, so let's talk about uh, what a Chinese painting calligraphy looks like. Let's look at an example right behind us. Notice this beautiful horse with a lot of energy with the brushwork just full of uh, power and energy to, to express this horse uh, uh, jumping up. And then the artist finish up with uh, writings. It's very typical that you have a painting with calligraphy introducing what the story is about. And then when the artist finished, he also put uh, his seal on it. Um, the example here, you have a seal here after this person uh, signed his name. And then there, there's a red seal again for, uh, to finish the painting. So uh, what do you think about the brushwork? Yeah, I think the brushwork is gorgeous. I think there's a lot of gesture, a lot of movement, a lot of energy here. And what I like that this artist has done in particular is that he's matched the style of the painting with the calligraphy. So in other words, nothing that's too blocky and too rigid. Um, it's kind of got this semi-cursive feeling to it that really um, coordinates well with the image itself. Good. Yeah. Okay, we're going to show you a couple more Chinese calligraphy paintings. What I have in my hand is what called the Kaishu standard style. You can see every character is very clearly written. You can see each one fits in one square, one after another. Space is evenly spaced, and uh, every character has uh, the stroke. You can see where it's flat or pointed, very standard. And then when the person finished, uh, she actually was a female artist, signed her name with two seal. So this is a very uh, typical standard style kaishu writing. Lucas. Yeah, and so we have here is um, a, another pairing of a um, painting with the calligraphy. Um, and you can see here, this is done probably in, in kind of like a, a very modern kaishu style. It's the block style. Um, and then you can see it kind of coordinates with the painting itself. Um, and one of the things that you uh, learn quickly with calligraphy, is that, or rather with painting, is that you need to learn the calligraphic techniques first in order to apply them to the painting itself. Um, so you learn usually the technique by studying calligraphy, and then you go to uh, the actual painting itself. Okay, let's talk about the history of Chinese calligraphy how Chinese invented the writings. Um, the very early ones were over 3,000 years old, and they were called the uh, Jagun. They were the carving characters, looked like uh, pictures in bones, shells, uh, uh, turtle shells, or uh, animal bones. They were the results of uh, ritual service, ritual ceremony, whatever the results they got, they would record on these bones. So Lucas, you know something about these bones. Yeah, so actually these bones were sold in traditional Chinese medicine shops as dragon bones. They weren't actually recognized as Chinese characters until in the 19th century when a Chinese scholar recognized these as the very earliest pictographic forms of the Chinese characters we know today. Yes, it's very cool. But carving on bones is very uh, inconvenient. So Chinese evolved. They made the writings simplified. So look at this picture with uh, seven characters. The upper left would be something you see on the bones. So this was the Jagun or the oracle script. You can see, look at what character do you think it is? 
I can take a guess. I'm going to say it's a dragon. Oh, excuse me, a tiger. That was going to say dragon. Dragon. <laughs> a dragon on the brain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it looks like a tiger. You can see in the Oracle Bone script, it has a very pictographic, it looks like the thing it's supposed to represent. And then over time, it's been systematized and simplified so that it becomes more of a writing style, right? Yeah, it's easier to, uh, to write. To, for everybody, to a picture. It's right, truly exactly. convenient. So, exactly. so if you look from the top, go from the left, continue going to the right, it becomes more of a rectangle or even square shape. It's the same character. You can kind of see similar lines, but they become more horizontal, vertical, easier to track. Mm -hmm. And um, so the one on the upper right is called the official script. And it was used a lot in the bronze uh, carving and some of the official writings in the early days. Um, and then when you go down to the right, it's something is a little more uh, uh, kind of scribbled together. So it's called a running script. The one in the center is the standard script, is the one that's used most of the time. And you write, you learn calligraphy with all these different strokes for the standard script. When you get better, then you can write the one on the right, which it's written as a running script, but I think it's more of a walking script. And then the one on the left is really fast. It's a, like a grass flying around, and I would call that a, a running script or cursive script. So, because which style do you like the best? Ah, that's a hard choice, but I think I enjoy the running script, the cursive script the most, the Sao shoot, and it's um, because it, it's where uh, you as an artist and calligrapher can really put your own expressive um, take on the character itself. With Kaishu, the more blocky style, it's um, you have to follow a lot of rules to make it completely legible. Um, whereas the cursive Taoshu is a little bit more expressive and you have a little bit more creative uh, you know, freedom. Yes, and actually we all started with calligraphy first before we were allowed to learn Chinese painting. You need to know how to use the brush, how to do the brush strokes before you could paint. And there are many, many guidebooks. Um, I have on the table, um, there are different styles so people will learn. And this is an example. I was learning to write one of the uh, style. And this is just how we learn. We repeat the same writing over and over until we got it done, and that's how we learn. Yeah, absolutely. I always say that uh, calligraphy is a lot like gymnastics, um, in that you have to stick every single part of your routine and then stick the landing. And can you plan on doing that perfectly? No, you can't. It's, it's practice, that means you keep practicing one sheet after one sheet after one sheet. Um, uh, myself, I can go through 500 sheets of paper in, within a week. Yes, that's... And you also get your uh, muscles on your yeah. arm build up. Yeah. Then you can <laughs> really raise your elbow when you're writing, and that's the goal. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to do a brief demonstration on how to write a Chinese poem in Shu, which is the running cursive script. Um, this is a really cool set of characters for autumn. Um, it basically says that there's a the sounds of geese at the border of a autumnal forest. So you can imagine the reds, the, the oranges, the colors of fall, in other words. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, I'm going to kind of show you quickly how to hold the brush. Um, I call it a flute hold or a flute grip. If you could just imagine that you're playing a flute and then turn it vertically and then that's kind of how you can hold your brush. Um, you want to make sure when you're first starting to load it full of ink because when you're doing the cursive style, um, it's all about connecting them all together so that you don't want to have to keep re-dipping your brush into the ink. It should be kind of a one dip and then you're out. So we're going to begin. The touch point is always the most important part. It should be nice and bold. As you can see, I probably put a little too much ink in there. And the nice thing about Cao Shu is it's a combination of fast and, and uh, slow brush strokes.
And in this particular set of characters, you want to make sure that these two tails sort of match, so they kind of communicate to each other. So I uh, decided that I'm going to do this again, because as you can see, the first character uh, has got a little bit too much ink, a little bit too much water, perhaps, and so it's sort of bled into the page. Um, sometimes you can do this effect, and it'll be a really cool stylization when you're doing calligraphy, um, but in my case, I don't really like it, so I'm going to do it again. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to just be quiet while I do this so I can concentrate. And there you have it. I give myself a C plus. <laughs> you are very nice. <laughs> so after you're finished with your piece, you're going to need to uh, stamp it. As Lily was mentioning, you're going to need to put a chop stamp, these red stamps, on your work. And that's like signing your work. Um, I created my own little stamp here, my chop stamp. Um, calligraphers, or part of the practice of being a calligrapher is actually making your own stamps as well. Um, I'm not Chinese, so I, didn't, I don't have necessarily Chinese characters ascribed to my name, so I got a little creative. Um, I'm actually from Mexico, and I decided to use the Maya character for drag, or excuse me, tiger, and uh, that kind of goes full circle to what we were talking about earlier. Um, because stamping, um, the first stamp is going to be a little, there's not enough pigment on the stamp itself. I recommend stamping three times. Especially if you spent a long time on your painting or on your piece of calligraphy, you want to make sure that you stamp it off on a little scrap piece of paper twice, and then your third stamp will go on your final. And this will ensure that you get enough pigment. You can see that there are certain sections of the stamp that don't have enough pigment, right? So that's why we go back into the ink one more time. And again, you don't want to spend all this time on your calligraphy or on your painting and then go to sign it and then mess it up, right? Because then you have to start all over again. So that's the second time you can see that it's kind of getting a little bit thicker. The pigment is more um, vivid. And then this is going to be the last one. I also recommend when you're uh, doing chop stamping um, to do it on a hard surface rather than a soft surface because um, the soft surface has a little bit of give um, and sometimes the stamp will come out correctly. I'm going to give it a little tiny bit of a push, and then voila. Wow. 